whoever else was involved in the decision to uh, uh, invite me to speak here tonight. Um, I guess thank you is in order. I, um, well, to be honest, when I received the invitation to do the last lecture, I was wondering if they knew something that I didn't. <laughs> uh, Randy Pausch, who was a professor at Carnegie Mellon and who gave this uh, last lecture, a big boost uh, through a YouTube video that's gone viral, uh, was dying of brain cancer at the time he gave his speech, and in his speech he did one-arm push-ups. I'm not going to do that, so <laughs> not? there's a couple of reasons. <laughs> so tonight I hope to be able to uh, share with you uh, some things you might chew on. And uh, this, uh, when I thought about the context of this speech, the last <coughs> lecture, I tried to envision um, a lesson that might be really important for uh, students to hear if uh, I can get the students to listen to me. And since you're here, those of you who are students, this is for you. It actually, uh, it's Genesis, the speech that I'm going to give tonight, the, the genesis of it was an article that Ricky Hallstrand shared with me. Ricky <coughs> Hallstrand is a biology teacher here uh, a couple of years ago called The Importance of Stupidity in Scientific Research. <laughs> The article was uh, authored by Martin Schwartz, who's a microbiologist at University of Virginia. And it appeared in the Journal of Cell Science in 2008. It's a one-page article. And I thought it was so profound, I kept it on my desktop on my computer all this time. And I read it and reread it. The story <laughs> that Schwartz tells is of an old friend who was a colleague in the world of science one of the brightest Schwartz had known. And uh, he was astonished to find out uh, that she decided to quit science entirely. But he was even more astonished to find out her reason for quitting. And uh, her reason, she told him, was because science made her feel stupid. After a couple of years of feeling stupid every day, she decided she was ready to try something else. Now, I'll quote Schwartz here. What she said bothered me. I kept thinking about it. Sometime the next day it hit me. Science makes me feel stupid too. It's just that I've gotten used to it. <laughs> so used to it, in fact, that I actively seek out new opportunities to feel stupid. I wouldn't know what to do without that feeling. I even think it's supposed to be this way. The reality is that one of the biggest challenges I faced as an instructor are students who are frozen because they're afraid to look stupid. They freeze up on exams, they freeze up in class, they refuse to answer questions, they refuse to participate because they're afraid of looking stupid. They have been taught by society and our school system, or maybe by their parents, or maybe by their friends, or somehow uh, got this idea inculcated into them that making mistakes is a bad thing. Failure is unthinkable. Every Little League soccer player gets a trophy. Every paper is an A paper. Every piano recital is outstanding. Schwartz continues. One of the beautiful things about science is that it allows us to bumble along, getting it wrong time after time, and feel perfectly fine as long as we learn something each time. No doubt that this can be difficult for students who are accustomed to getting the answers right. No doubt, reasonable levels of confidence and emotional resilience help, but I think scientific education might do more to ease what is a very big transition from learning what other people once discovered 
to making your own discoveries. The more comfortable we become with being stupid, the deeper we will wade into the unknown and the more likely we are to make big discoveries. So tonight I'd like to share with you why I think it's really important to make mistakes. Sometimes really big mistakes in all aspects of life, not just in science. I believe personally that we learn much more from our failures than we ever do from our successes. And I hope to convince you to join me in an effort to become the biggest failure you can become. <laughs> it will be a totally freeing experience. Uh, to be honest, I was one of those obnoxious kids <clears throat> you knew from grade school or high school who was really good at school. I was always in the top two or three in the math classes. I won the spelling bee. I was a teacher's pet. I answered all the questions in class. People thought I was a nerd, and they were right. In fact, I never got a grade below B on any paper through my junior college experience, in grade school, high school, or junior college. An experience in my junior year of college, at my senior college, changed me forever and taught me more about what education is really about than anything I had ever achieved by getting an A on a paper before it. So I was taking a course called Problems in Science and Theology from an elderly professor at Concordia Seward named Carl T. Brandhorst. Dr. Brandhorst was in his 48th year, so compared to me, he was young. I mean, I, I'm young compared to him. And, and uh, he was uh, challenging us to go outside of this little town in Nebraska, Seward, Nebraska, and dig around in the hills outside of town uh, and discover what we could discover there. And then we were to write a paper, and he said uh, that we were to write a paper telling why we thought that the things we found out there in these hills were there. And so we went out dutifully and took shovels and got in these sand hills out there and in the dirt and started digging around, and lo and behold, we find shark's teeth. And we find fossil sea lilies and we find trilobites, which are marine fossils, and we find nautiluses, which are marine fossils, and all ammonites, and all these marine fossils, old suckers, in the dirt, in Nebraska, a thousand miles from the nearest ocean. So, being the nerd that I was, uh, I followed his directions. He said, write a 10-page paper and have 15 references. Now, you gotta understand this is in the days before computers. So this was on a, my old Olympus typewriter. Okay, what well, name electric? It was an Olympus <coughs> typewriter. Okay. And if you made a mistake, they had these little pencils that had a rubber on the front end and a brush on the back end, and you had to rub the paper. Dolores remembers this, rub the paper. And it would, nine times out of 10, you'd rub a hole in the paper, and you'd have to throw the paper away and you type the page, okay? That was the way he corrected papers in those days when we walked uphill to school both ways barefoot in the snow. <laughs> <laughs> and so I wrote this paper, and instead of 10 pages, I wrote a 20 page paper. And instead of it being 15 references, I wrote 30 references. I had 30 references, and it was perfect. There wasn't a typo, there was not a grammatical error in it. It was Margins were correct. It was in the correct APA format. Everything was perfect. So, of course, I turned it in and got it back a few days later, and it had a big, fat, red D on the top of the paper. I didn't recognize that letter. I'd never <laughs> seen it. <laughs> I didn't know what that meant. You know. I thought maybe it was, I'm deliriously happy with your paper. I, I, I couldn't figure out what it was. So uh, when it sunk in that he actually had given me a D, I was horrified. 
I'm still horrified, 45 years later, I'm still horrified that I got a D in that paper. So, of course, what I did was I walked into his office and I said, Dr. Brandhorst, there must be some mistake. This paper is perfect. <laughs> and he looked at me and he said, Mr. Kuhner, by the way, he was a fellow about that big, and he was, at the time, seven years old. And he looked at me and he said, Mr. Kuhnert, there is no mistake. You did not do what I asked you to do. I said, what do you mean? He said, I asked you to tell me what you thought was the reason these fossils were in these hills. And all you did was tell me what other people thought. I I was angry. I was upset. I stormed out of his office, went back to my dorm room, and yelled at my roommates and pouted. And three weeks later, it hit me. That's what college is about. It's not about learning what other people think. It's thinking for yourself. I learned more from that failure than I had ever learned from any grade of A or B prior to that. I cannot tell you what the content was of any paper I wrote before that on which I got an A. I can't. I don't remember. That I do. Well, after I graduated from Seward, and they did let me graduate despite the D, <laughs> uh, I was uh, uh, 22. My wife and I moved out here from Michigan, where we're both from, and we came to Concordia. We had people asking us at the time whether there were uh, electrical wires in the town, if there was plumbing in the houses and things like that. It, people in the Midwest have this view of the Pacific Northwest, where they did in 1969, of uh, the frontier, the great frontier. <laughs> <laughs> they were afraid we were going to get attacked by Indians on the way to out here. Whatever. But one of the unique things uh, uh, was the nature of this beast. And in fact, uh, if you were to go beyond those curtains and sit, the first morning we ever arrived on this campus, uh, my wife and I, Pat, walked up here and sat at a table, and the business, uh, uh, business manager, Bill Gustav, sat us down, and he sat with us at the table, and he pointed out that window right there, that window, and he said, this is your house. He gave us our house. It was part of my salary. My salary was $4,500 for the year. 1969, we had 14 faculty members, and we had 125 students in the college in 1969. But one of those 14 faculty members was F.W.J. Sylvester, who had founded the college in 1905, and he was still alive, <laughs> and he was still working every day on the faculty. He had retired as president in 1946, and then he went on to become librarian part-time for the rest of his career from 1946 until he died in 1972. Okay, so he was here for 67 years working. You know, I'm a piker. I've only been here 42, you know, so I got a long way to go to catch up with him. As I said before, we had come from Michigan. That's important in this story. And the second thing you need to know is I teach biology. And so I was the biology department. In fact, I was also the chemistry department. I'm sorry, Tom, but I was. <laughs> I taught all the biology and chemistry in the college for that first year. I was 22 years old. I had a bachelor's degree, and I was teaching college. I tell you, I did not know what I was doing. <laughs> So one day I was walking to the old biology lab, which is now the art room, Luther 101, to give my you know, wonderful lecture to my students to eradicate their ignorance. 
<laughs> and Dr. Sylvester walked up. He approached me, and uh, I said that Dr. Brandhorst at Seward was this tall, Dr. Sylvester was this tall. <laughs> he was. He was a very small, wiry man. And he was a man of few words. Uh, in fact, in the whole time I knew him, I think he probably spoke four sentences to me the whole time. But one of them was, this, uh, I have to step back. It, this happened the third week of January, my first year here. And he walked up to me and said, <coughs> the crocuses are blooming. <laughs> and of course, being from Michigan and being a biology professor, I said, they're not blooming. They can't be blooming. They don't bloom until March. Well, they don't bloom until March in Michigan. You know. So the next morning, I came to my podium, and there lay a purple crocus. <laughs> Never said a word to me. I learned a lesson. I began to know how much I don't know. It took me about 10 years to figure out that I really didn't know very much, especially about teaching science, because I had never done science. I had only read about doing science. And believe me, there is a huge difference. So I decided to bite the bullet and risk, and so I entered graduate school, and I was accepted into uh, an area of research that I picked that I thought would be the cutting edge area for research for the future, uh, which was molecular genetics, and I was right. That actually, this was 1980, I was applying, and uh, that was exactly the time when that science took off. So I was accepted into a program at the University of Oregon called the Genetics Training Grant Program. There were six students that were accepted into that program out of about 100 applicants. Uh, while I had begun to understand the limitations of my knowledge, I was blown out of the water when I got to the University of Oregon to find out how stupid I really was. And I mean stupid. I mean literally. The first six months I was at the University of Oregon, I spent the entire time trying to figure out how to read science papers, which is why I insisted that biology majors and chemistry majors at Concordia read science papers, papers, because I couldn't do it when I got to graduate school, which was very embarrassing to me. Okay. I would, felt constantly like I was swimming upstream against the current. There were so many, many really, really smart people there. It amazed me. For two years, I took advanced level coursework in molecular genetics and related fields. I worked in the laboratory. And at the end of the second year, they have a process in the PhD program called comprehensive exams. They're sort of like admit the major on steroids. Okay? <laughs> and what you have to do is you have to uh, study 10 areas of competency that they assign to you, like enzyme kinetics and uh, DNA modification and RNA splicing and gene regulation and stuff like that. And you have to know everything about it, literally everything about it. Okay. In addition, you have to write three research proposals that are novel. Nobody has ever done that research before. And you have to decide how to do those research uh, proposals, how to uh, carry out the methodology of them. And then they. Um, Examine you. A team of five professors examines you on those three proposals and the ten areas. And they can ask you any question they want. It's, they're gods at that point. <laughs> so, and, and what's more, if you flunk, you're out. You're done. You spent two years of your hard-earned money and time and research and putting up with tough courses, and you're out. It's, it's that brutal. So the uh, preparation for that event, I took about uh, seven weeks off of work to study full time. And I was studying 12 to 14 hours a day, seven days a week for seven weeks. Okay, and I just really thought I had everything down. And I had these three research proposals, which were, I thought, marvelous proposals, of course. And uh, I thought through carefully how I was going to 
present them and everything. But of course, as you might imagine, I had a lot of anxiety. I was a lot, very nervous about coming to the comprehensive exams. So I decided to blow off some steam by going and playing basketball at the gym that morning of my comprehensive exam. The comprehensive exam started at noon. I went at about 10 o'clock to the gym and started playing basketball, which I did a lot of in those days. And everything was fine. For, I played for about 50 minutes and decided about 10 minutes before the end of the hour, I'd step out and go take my shower and get ready to go to the exams. And just at the point I stepped out, a guy, uh, one, there was a five on five game, and a guy on one of the teams sprained his ankle. So the coach who was standing on the sideline says, Kooner, go in there for that guy. So I go in, you got a picture of this. I go in there, and uh, I'm six one or less, okay, and he's got me guarding this guy that's six ten. <laughs> he weighs about 280, okay, and so the guy posts me up, gets the basketball, does one of these numbers, boom, catches me right here, okay? I'm wearing glasses, like I am tonight, except they were plastic frames. <laughs> Smashes the glasses in half, cuts my eyebrow from here to here, okay? Blood's gushing everywhere. So I don't have time to go to the infirmary, I don't have any, because I gotta go to my exam. So I take the glasses and I take white athletic tape and I tape, tape it together and hold them there and then I craft some butterfly bandages out of regular bandages by snipping them with scissors. So you got a picture, I got three butterfly bandages holding this and I got my glasses like this and I look a lot worse than that guy does right there. Okay. So uh, that's the way I went to my comprehensive exams. And when I walked into the comprehensive exams I found out that one of the five members of my committee in fact, the kindest of the five members of the committee had a toothache and was not able to come. And so in his place was the British chairman of the department, Roderick Capaldi. Okay. <laughs> now, Capaldi and I had, had some run-ins earlier in my experience with him, and he was not a pleasant fellow. So I was not really pleased that he was there. But he said, uh, well, I'm not going to say anything. I, I, I'm not part of the committee, so I won't say anything. So I thought, whew, oh, good. But he asked the first question. He said, uh, Mr. Coonerty, he said, uh, please uh, explain research proposal two. So the computer starts cranking over here, and I go, research proposal two. I know exactly what I'm going to say, so I say, OK, uh, in this case, we're talking about the molecule ubiquitin, which is found attached to proteins on And he goes, stop! He yells out, stop! <laughs> what? I don't want to hear any of this trivia. I just need the basics. OK. I was gone. I was dead. Dead in the water. Okay, so now I'm trying to recraft how to say my whole proposal in language that he wants to hear when I've got it memorized in the language that I want to say, and I can't do it. It goes from bad to worse. So they start asking me questions, and I start stumbling and bumbling, and I look like an idiot. It was bad. <laughs> So they asked me to step out of the room after about two and a half hours of this. Uh, so I walked out of the room and uh, I'm standing out there going, my doom is sealed. I know exactly what's going to happen here. And sure enough, I walk back in the room and they say, we regret to inform you that you've failed. So one of the committee members was Karen Sprague, who was, she had mentored me the prior semester. I worked in her lab, and I became pretty close friends with her. And so at the end of it, I went up to her and I said, Karen, what happened? How could I have flunked this? And she said something I'll never forget. She said, Chuck, you have a profound grasp of the obvious. <laughs> So not only did I fail my exam, I was an idiot. <laughs> I literally went home and cried. I did. I was devastated. I was in a deep depression. I uh, had, it was really tough for me to go back to work the next day, but I had to. 
Fortunately, they give you a second chance. You get the option of retaking your comps, but you have to wait six weeks to do it. There were six people, I said, that got in the genetics training grant. Three of us flunked the exam. I was the only one that retook it. The other two walked away from the program. To my surprise, when I got back into the room with the committee members, they bent over backwards to help me. All they wanted was for me to demonstrate to them that I could overcome failure with perseverance. I didn't know that when I walked in there. But I had won the badge of uh, their approval simply by getting up off the mat. That's a very important lesson about failure. All scientists fail almost all the time. It's a part of the job. So, uh, <laughs> this cartoon was actually given to me in framed format uh, by uh, an alumnus of Concordia, a gal named Tracy Christensen, who graduated in 1988. And uh, when she was a student, I had the pleasure of having her in my beginning biology class. And I recognized in her right away the real potential. She didn't, unfortunately, she did not recognize that same potential in herself. And so she struggled for a while with what she should do with her life. And one day I had a chance to talk with her. And I said, you know, Tracy, you're really bright in science. You should really give science a try. And um, when I suggested that, she was very skeptical. And she told me that she thought she was too stupid to do science. So I shared with her. Uh, the stories that I just shared with you. And it convinced her to give it a try. And I'm proud to say that today, Tracy heads a cancer research lab in Omaha, Nebraska. When she graduated from Concordia, she went to a lab at OHSU and was, uh, worked her way up from, with just a bachelor's degree, worked her way up to the lab director for a very prestigious lab doing cancer research at OHSU. lesson there is the only people who do not fail are the people who do not try. So uh, the next story is the great fruit fly escape. <laughs> now, I, I said before that uh, you know, I passed my comps and I got admitted to the PhD program. Um, and now what you do after that is you do full-time research. And so uh, I had to determine what problem I was going to study in my research. and. What I want to do, and so uh, I thought a long time about this, and I thought, well, a really good thing to study would be to figure out why men don't make milk. <laughs> I, I mean, do you ever think about that? <laughs> men have breasts, they have nipples. How come the women are the only one have to take care of the kids? You know? <laughs> Wow, what's that all about? I mean, it's a very simple question, actually. As all, I think, good science questions ultimately turn out to be. So the problem is that when you approach a question like that, getting an answer is like walking blindly, blindfolded through a maze. You just don't know where you're going, and you stumble, and you fall, and you have to pick yourself up all the time and, and uh, move on. So uh, the way I ended up approaching is I, you know, one of the things you'd find about me if you knew me any length of time, especially in science and the way I treat, treat science, is I'm a firm believer in the, um, uh, the sort of muscle your way through approach to science instead of the finesse approach. There are people who are really bright, and they do science that has a lot of finesse to it. And then there are those of us who aren't very bright who beat things to death. <laughs> That's what I do. I'm not beating sure. to death. So the way I approached this problem was I decided to use fruit flies as my experimental model. Because they, while they don't make milk, they make yolk. 
females make yolk for eggs, and males don't make yolk, even though males have the genes to make yolk, they just don't make yolk. So I ask, I, it's hard to, I mean, to be honest, it's a lot easier to work on fruit flies than humans. <laughs> They're much more malleable. They don't complain when you stick them in little vials. You can make them randomly. And they, you know, humans, there's a lot of problems with that. <laughs> so uh, what I did was I, uh, I, I created <laughs> a gene. <laughs> <laughs> and I uh, uh, created a, a way of testing uh, why it was that fruit flies didn't, male fruit flies didn't make yolk uh, by this construct that I had made out of DNA. And in order to test it, what you had to do is you had to inject it into fruit fly eggs. Yeah. Okay. So you have to picture this. I injected 1,500 fruit fly eggs. And before you can inject them, you have to shell them. Oh. Now, think about a fruit fly. Think about the egg. Think about 1,500 of them. Think about the fact that the egg itself, once it doesn't have a shell, is just a cell that's only surrounded by the plasma membrane, which is this microscopically thin little layer of jelly-like stuff. And so if they shake it all, the egg goes boom. <laughs> It's no good. You can't get a fly to hatch out of poop. Okay. So, so you have to do it in a refrigerated room. And you have to do it between midnight and 6 a.m. Because if anybody walks down the hall, the vibration of their feet is enough to break the egg apart. All right. So it gives you a scope of this. So 1,500 injections later, and then, like an expectant father, Tyler, Pete, where are you? An expectant father, we sit there waiting for these things to hatch. And lo and behold, six of the 1,500 are hatched with my genes in them. I won't go into the gory details. But, all right, so now you've got six flies, and you have to do two things with them. First of all, you have to keep them alive. So you feed them. You put them in little vials with food, you feed them, and you let them grow up. And then secondly, because you need to have the next generation, you have to mate them. Well, in order to mate them, you have to take them out of the vials. And So one night, at about 10 o'clock at night, after about 14 hours of work that day, I'm sitting there with these six vials, looking at my flies, getting ready to mate one of them. And so I open the vial, and I dump it into the ether. I said, get it to calm down and go to sleep, and it flies away. <laughs> it flies away. <laughs> no! <laughs> that DNA construct that took a year to make, those flies, it took me six weeks to inject 1,500 flies for six hours a night in the middle of the night, not getting any sleep, and the fly just flew away. So like a madman, I'm running around the lab taking tape and sealing every opening below the door on the edges of the windows. I'm, not, I'm trying to find that fly. I failed. Science sucks sometimes. <laughs> Okay. Here you go, Gary. And Julie. This this story is called Bernie and the Blues. All right. So uh, among many other things that I've done in my 42 years at Concordia, uh, one of the things that was a real joy was being able to coach the women's basketball team here for many years. I started coaching here uh, in the college in 1978. Uh, I had coached high school some before that. There was a high school on this campus at the time. I coached that team. And then the team moved off campus one year, and I coached them there. And I had coached in Minnesota for one year, a girls team. The girls team in Minnesota I coached. That was the first team I ever coached in 1971. And I coached it because the girl came up to me and said, my mom coached the team last year. She can't do it this year. Would you do it? And I said, what? I mean, I was a nerd. I wasn't a jock. I didn't, I didn't play basketball. I played a little JV basketball in high school and some church league. I didn't know anything about basketball. So, of course, I said yes. <laughs> and I started coaching them. And this was in a time when the girls playing basketball still wore skirts on the floor. They did. This is before Title IX, so they were horrible. 
I mean, you, oh, you can't believe how bad they were. Anyway, so when I came back to the college after teaching in the high school in 1978, the president at EP Weber said to me, uh, I'd like you to come teach biology at the college again. And I said, OK, I'll come on one condition. And that is that I coached the women's basketball team. And he said, this is a quote, are you crazy? <laughs> That's exactly what he said. I said, yes, I am crazy, and thank you. So uh, anyway, I was fortunate enough uh, that I had really great players to overcome my ineptness as a coach. And, uh, and in 1978-79 and 1979-80, we were in a small Christian college league called the Pacific Northwest Christian College League. And uh, we won the league both years. And then in, in that second year, my leading scores, the two top scorers, graduated. So the next year, we got bumped up to the big <laughs> leagues. We went to AIAW, which was the women's equivalent of NCAA at the time. NCAA did not have a women's division in 1980. So the AIW was uh, the women's sports league in America in college. And we were in with all the state schools, Western Oregon, Eastern Oregon, Southern Oregon, Whitworth, Whitman, Linfield, Lewis and Clark, all these teams. They was like, oh my gosh. And I, my leading scores had left. I got Daylene DeWitt, who's here now, she's back there. She's on this team. That's her in the middle of 23. That's her. Okay. And uh, you were junior that year, right? No, you're sophomore. No, junior. You were junior. Janice Edwards was a sophomore, and we started three freshmen, OK? Uh, number 35, Bernie Larson. Uh, number 33, Judy Rigger. And number uh, 41, uh, Virginia Oak. Uh, and that's, by the way, Julie Rowland on the right. <laughs> and that's me. <laughs> uh, so anyway. Um, I, I, we always held a preseason retreat, and I took the girls to this retreat. And I, I was talking with them. I said, "Okay, we're going to set some really high goals here for us. We're going to go 500 this year. We're going to win half our games." And they looked at me like I was crazy, and I thought I was crazy. <laughs> so the first day of practice, I don't know if Daily remembers this. First day of practice, I probably shouldn't embarrass her like this. First day of practice. I thought I had given the kids a really hard practice. In fact, one of the team members vomited at the end of practice. I won't say who it was, but <laughs> <laughs> to protect those that are present. But, uh, <laughs> so I thought we did a good job. You know, if I get a puking, I'm doing a good job. So that was my sort of gold standard. <laughs> So I, I get Julie over there, and uh, we're talking at the end of practice. And I look over to the side, and here's Bernie Larson, number 35, doing blues. Now, blues are this torture chamber thing that I devise that you know, most coaches use, where you run from side to side of the gym and touch the blue line in a specified amount of time. So I always set like 17 or 18 per minute. And I knew that they couldn't make 18. So uh, if you don't make 18, then you have to do it again. Okay. And well, then we drop it one to 17. You know, so it encourages them to run fast. And, uh, so I look over there, and Bernie Larson is doing wind sprints. I didn't talk to her. I didn't tell her to do wind sprints. I, she's just doing them back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Okay. And I look at Julie, and Julie looks at me like, who is this kid, and what's she about? Okay. So. They didn't say anything to anybody. Next night, it would come to practice. And here there are three girls doing wind sprints. And Bernie had not. I don't think Bernie had talked to any of them. I think the other two girls just decided to join and do wind sprints. By the end of the week, even Daylene was doing wind sprints. <laughs> and we never said a word. The team did it. OK. We went 28 and 0 that year. Whoa. What Bernie had found out, and what she was doing, was she pushed herself to the point of failure. 
she found out that if you don't push yourself to failure, you never really improve. And it's amazing what one person can accomplish by setting an example of taking on the fear of failure by themselves. All right. Now we hope this works. Am I going? How do I shut this off now? I don't want to do that. Thing. All right. So we're going to have a little musical interlude here. So bear with me. <laughs> Cordia's choir has sung this piece. This is Mozart's Requiem. It's one piece of Mozart's Requiem called Dies Irae, Day, Day of Wrath. This was Mozart's last composition before he died. He died before he completed this composition, actually, at the age of 36. Mozart is uh, considered by many to be one of the greatest musicians, greatest composers of all time. It's continued popularity, his music, is testimony to his greatness. That Mozart could compose over 600 works in his brief life is amazing, but it's even more amazing that his first composition occurred when he was five years old. This painting depicts him playing his own composition between the, uh, before the royalty of Austria, his home country. Often, Mozart is depicted as a boy genius, a boy wonder. And in some sense, obviously, he really was. But a closer analysis by the Swedish psychologist Anders Ericsson, as reported in David Schenk's book, The Genius in All of Us, puts a different light on Mozart's achievements. He suggested, and I agree, that the giftedness of Mozart was not the cause of something, but the result of something. Talent does not create a process, but is the end result of the process. High achievement in sports or the arts or science is much more attainable by human beings than implied by the notion of special giftedness or genius. He points out that Mozart's father was a music teacher who began training Mozart before he was two years old to play the violin. His elder sister had been playing for four and a half years prior to that 
and Mozart himself, Amadeus, Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart, had been exposed to that music that whole time. Mozart engaged in what Erickson calls deliberate practice that resulted after many years of hard work into the genius we observe in his music. At age five, Mozart was a dazzling pianist and composer for his age. He was not as good as an adult pianist. Even a mediocre adult pianist was better than Mozart at age five. It was only with practice and a special type of practice that Mozart became a genius. <clears throat> that deliberate practice that Erickson talks about is the same kind of practice that Bernie Larson and that team in 1980-81 practiced. Pushing yourself to failure. Not being satisfied repeating the same exercise over and over again, but every time challenging yourself to do something that you know you can't do. Erickson's studies of so-called genius demonstrate that all so-called geniuses have one thing in common. That is, by the time they're recognized as a genius, they have spent over 10,000 hours practicing their craft. It takes an average of 10 years, three hours a day, to gain that kind of competency. This is what Erickson says. Deliberate practice is a very special form of activity that differs from mere experience and mindless drill. Unlike playful engagement with peers, deliberate practice is not inherently enjoyable. It does not involve a mere execution or repetition of already attained skills, but repeated attempts to reach beyond one's current level, which is associated with frequent failures. In other words, it is practice that doesn't take no for an answer practice that perseveres, the type of practice where the individual keeps raising the bar of what he or she considers success. This was Bernie Larson's gift and Mozart's as well. It can be yours. Alva Edison, 50 years after he invented the phonograph, that recorded and replayed for the first time in history the human voice. That occurred in 1877, and the words, Mary had a little lamb, her fleece was white as snow, was what he recorded in that initial recording in 1877 on his invention, the Edison cylinder phonograph. Edison like Mozart, is often considered a genius for his inventions. His inventions include the light bulb, usable forms of electricity that still power our homes today, the disc phonograph, the cylinder phonograph, and film projectors, movie projectors. In total, he held 1,093 patents for inventions he had made. All this he accomplished, despite the fact he was considered a failure in school. And by far, the majority of the inventions he ever made were never useful. They, in fact, were failures. He once said, I have not failed. I've just found 10,000 ways that don't work. <laughs> he was an unwitting advocate of Erickson's deliberate practice. He also is the one who said, Genius is 1% inspiration and 99% perspiration. I visited his research laboratory that now sits in Greenfield Village, just outside the city of Detroit. It was originally in Menlo Park, New Jersey. This is the laboratory in which he perfected the light bulb. 
they took it board by board from New Jersey and moved it to this park outside of Detroit. And in it, you will see testimony, not to his genius, but to his failures. He had 800 different forms of light bulb before he found the first practical incandescent bulb. None of those 799 were ever used. They were all failures. Thomas J. Watson was the CEO of International Business Machines. The list of famous people who predicated their success on failures is endless, and Thomas Watson is one of the best. His resume is not sterling. If you were looking at his resume, you probably would not have hired him. His first career was as a teacher. It lasted one day. He quit, decided he wasn't cut out to be a teacher and wanted to be a bookkeeper, so he went back to school to get accounting skills and become a bookkeeper. He hated school, he dropped out of school, he became a bookkeeper and lost that job after one year. Then he became an itinerant salesman who went around uh, trying to uh, sell whatever he could sell and he was a failure at that. His next venture was as a butcher, opening a butcher shop in Buffalo, New York. That also failed and left Watson with no money, no bank account, no job, and no career. But he did have a cash register that he had bought for the butcher shop. And so he, took the, uh, he went to National Cash Register, the company that made the cash register, and tried to arrange to have the uh, cash register uh, bill transferred to the new owner of the butcher shop. And in so doing, he met the man manager of this uh, National Cash Register, NCR, and in talking to him, convinced him to allow him to become a salesman for NCR. And that was after about 15 years of frustration and failures in other careers. He went on to become the head of National Cash Register, and later on, by selling used cash registers, he cornered the market on cash registers in America, and he formed IBM. And IBM became one of the largest international corporations in the early part of the 20th century and remained that way throughout the 20th century with his son running the company. Dismissed from drama school with a note that read, wasting her time because she's too shy to put her best foot forward. Turned down by the Decca recording company who said, we don't like their sound and guitar music is on the way out. A failed soldier, farmer, and real estate agent. At 38 years old, he went to work for his father as a handyman. Cut from the high school basketball team, he went home, locked himself in his room, and cried. A teacher told him he was too stupid to learn anything and he should go into a field where he might succeed by virtue of his pleasant personality. Fired from a newspaper because he lacked imagination and had no original ideas. His fiance died, he failed in business twice, he had a nervous breakdown, and he was defeated in eight elections. If you never failed, you've never lived. necessary prerequisite to success is a common feature of all humankind. The greatest of all the apostles, St. Paul, began as a persecutor of Christians, and this painting is of the stoning of Stephen, to which Paul, at that time known as Saul, was a witness. He called himself 
the chief of sinners. But the Bible tells us that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We are all, without exception, failures. Saul was chosen by God and converted into the apostle Paul through God's grace, a fact that Paul found great glory in. Paul quotes Jesus saying, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, Paul says, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weakness, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Through Christ, our failures are turned into strengths. Martin Luther puts an interesting twist on Paul's words from 2 Corinthians in this quote. He is speaking directly to the issue of our failures and saying, in effect, that we cannot let the reality of our sinfulness paralyze us. If you are a preacher of mercy, do not preach an imaginary, but the true mercy. If the mercy is true, you must therefore bear the truth, not an imaginary sin. God does not save those who are only imaginary sinners. Be a sinner and let your sins be strong, but let your trust in Christ be stronger and rejoice in Christ who is the victor over sin, death, and the world. When Luther says, let your sins be strong, or sin boldly, as it is in other translations, he's urging us to live lives of risk, to embrace the gift of God's grace, which will cover and has covered all of our shortcomings and failures. It's through Christ's grace, won by his sacrificial death and resurrection, that we have the ability to live boldly and confidently even when we know we will fail and frequently do. Thank you for your patience with me this evening. You've been most gracious to me.